Um, so we are all gathered here. Thank you so much for coming out today to have a time, you know, some time with Susan Ito. Um, I wanted to preface this by saying that normally when you come to an event, you get this straightforward biography, but Susan and I have been friends for a very long time. I think I met Susan in something like 1989 or 1990 when I was a student at Mills College as an undergraduate and Susan was um, in graduate school at Mills, but we were both doing the writing thing. Um, so even from that age um, and that time, I should say, Susan was writing. And I swear there's never been a time in my life, because we've never lost touch, when she wasn't writing, like really doggedly working towards whether it was shorter stories or essays or ideas of drafts and the, the, the book that really becomes I would, uh, I would Meet You Anywhere. I had to look at the title because I've known you long enough that the title has changed. Um, I will say that we also had this amazing experience at Mills where um, we had met in an ethnic studies department class and Susan really just saw the potential of many of the writers in that class to form a Asian American women's writers group that we called Rice Papers. And we were serious. We were so serious about this. We met regularly. We wrote. We shared. We went on retreats to, to Tahoe. And I mean, from an early age to have somebody who's like, we're not playing. We're really doing this was a real, it was a real gift. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that this has been a long friendship and I'm really so excited to be here sitting today with this book. There were other books that have been published, but this is a special book. Um, I did want to say that in addition to um, I Would Meet You Anywhere that Susan has actually co-edited a literary anthology called A Ghost at Heart's Edge, Stories and Poems of Adoption. And like I mentioned, her own stories and essays have been widely published and anthologized in collections like Making More Waves and Growing Up Asian American. I have all three of these books that I'm mentioning. Um, I also want to remember, I was thinking about this while, this morning getting ready, there was a period when you were writing and blogging fiercely. And I, I followed a lot of that and I just think that takes another kind of perseverance to write regularly and share it to the public. So it's never, it's always been a part of a bigger community. She's also written and performed a solo show titled The Ice Cream Gene that has traveled and she's performed all over the United States. She's a member of the Writers Grotto in San Francisco and teaches at Mills College slash Northeastern University and Bay Path University. You still doing that? Yes, okay and was a co-founder of Rooted and Written, a no-fee writing workshop for writers of color. But that's the formal stuff. I mean, Susan is always doing stuff for everyone, especially in the literary community. I mean, there's other ones, but. And I wrote, Susan was born to write. She is like the literary definition of a person deeply committed to community and is at the heart of so many of them. I have never known Susan, I'm getting upset. <laughs> When she wasn't writing or participating in writer groups, workshops, submitting and publishing, teaching and simply putting in the incredible amount of work to hone her craft, every word is hard earned. She goes to every book launch and reading of her literary colleagues and buys every single book and then she's actually passing this on by teaching them in the classroom. So this is time for Susan's flowers. Okay. So let's talk about the book that's just been published. I understand that several of you here today read the book in the JSA Book Club, which I think is fantastic. I Would Meet You Anywhere is a complex map of cultural signals and contexts that are rooted specifically in the Japanese American community. It is a story about family, love, identity, and a decades long search for your birth parents. You're biracial, half Japanese, or hanbun hanbun. That was one of the potential titers at one time, Hanbun Hanbun. Um, you were adopted as an infant and raised by a Nisei family living in New Jersey. So I want to say that like one of the important things about reading this book was feel, reading it from beginning to end and just feeling the, the ebbs and flows of your life because it is a, a pretty full arc. And I just resonated so deeply with so much of the cultural pieces of it, whether it was your birth parents and how you were raised and 
kind of like the way that you were nervous about reacting, re reactions from others in our community, but there's a lot we share. And I think that um, this is one of your first readings that you've done for specifically Japanese American community space. Um, it is the first, okay, see? And I think that that gives us a unique opportunity to talk about some of those um, specific identity and cultural um, touch points that are some things that we see in this book that are very, very important and meaningful to us as Japanese Americans. Um, so, I mean, I'm just so delighted that this has been such a beautiful launch, right? So the book, it came out in November, right? And you've been traveling all over the country, reading everywhere. Um, I, I, I think I, that's all I have to say about the book. That's the background of it. And I just, given the context and the audience today, I'm going to just invite you to read an excerpt to start us out. Um, wow. I'm emotional too. <laughs> I could not think of anyone I would rather have this conversation with than Patricia, who's been such an integral part of my community and our family. And I'll say a little bit more about it later, but really helped draw me into the Japanese American community not long after I moved out here. Um, and I was feeling kind of lost without my parents and my community back home. And um, she really was an anchor for me. And so this friendship is everything for me. And also to be here, Jay Say, okay, I'm really gonna cry. Um, <laughs> Jay Say was such an incredibly important support for my mom in the last years of her life after she moved out here. And Glenn would come and pick her up every week and bring her to lunch. And she really, um, looked forward to it and would get all dressed up in the same red and black dress every time and her pearls and um, it was a big deal for her to come out and and to have fellowship with people out here and it meant a lot it's hard to make new friends when you're in your 80s and 90s and and she did do that and as so I really am so grateful to JC it's so important to me okay so I think um, the basics of the book, I grew up with Nisei parents who adopted me and um, and I'm uh, Hambun Hambun, as uh, Patricia said. My, my editor was like, I don't think that's a good title because people are going to be like, ham bun, ham bun, what's that? Is it a hamburger? What is it? And so they nixed that title and um, I, I'm actually really happy with the title that, that we, we landed on. Like. Oh, very shortly before going to print. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. Hi. <laughs> um, I'm going to read a section that I have never read in a public event before, um, but I felt like it would really resonate particularly with this community, and it's called Go For Broke. I think you all know what that means. I grew up in Park Ridge, a small town in northern New Jersey, within walking distance of the New York state border. My parents were Masaji and Kikuko Ito, and we lived in a pale green ranch house. Oof. On Summit Street, they had adopted me when I was three and a half months old. We were the only Japanese Americans in town and the only Asians until I was in third grade and a Chinese American family arrived. My parents each had two brothers. My grandparents, uncles, aunts, and cousins all lived in nearby counties. Every Sunday, we drove into Manhattan to our church, which attracted Japanese American families from every borough and nearby state. My mother had been born and raised in Brooklyn and my father in the Bronx. The church had been the center of their community since they were children. My life felt split in half. Weekdays, we were immersed in white suburban life, and weekends, we connected with our Asian roots. My cousins were like weekend siblings to me. We gathered in each other's backyards while the uncles hammered away on home improvement projects and the aunties stuffed Inari Zushi pillows and served them along hot dogs and potato salad. I rarely saw other Asian faces in our town and I wasn't used to seeing them in the media either. We didn't have access to the infinite television and cable channels that are now available. 
Our viewing was limited to the four major networks, and our choices were laid out for us in the weekly TV Guide, which arrived in our mailbox once a week. I loved TV Guide. I read all the Hollywood gossip and trivia and poured through every day's listings, marking the shows I wanted to watch with a red pen. My mother was a television fanatic. My father worked as a traveling salesman and was away from home for weeks at a time, and the television helped distract her from her loneliness. She mostly watched sports, baseball and football, or game shows or reruns of I Love Lucy. But another one of our favorites was The Courtship of Eddie's Father, which featured Miyoshi Umeki, one of the few Japanese-American actresses at the time. Miyoshi is on, we called to each other, as if she were a family friend. One listing that I always kept an eye out for was the 1950s movie Go For Broke, which we all referred to as Daddy's War Movie. It turned up once or twice a year, usually in the wee hours of the morning, 2 a.m., the late, late show. The first time I remember seeing it, I was only eight. My mother came to wake me up with a fake candle with a light bulb flame and a brass holder. The yellow light fell around my bed in a buzzy, buttery circle. The television broad the, the broadcast glowed in black and white, even though we had a color television. Big script letters filled the screen. Van Johnson, the big star. I recognized him because Lucy and I Love Lucy was always trying to get his autograph or talk to him. She and her best friend Ethel swooned over Van Johnson, though I didn't understand why. I thought he was blonde and bland looking. But it impressed my father that he was in Go For Broke. Big star, he nodded. Big deal that they got him to sign on, he said. He was a good man to do this, to be in a movie with a bunch of Nihon jeans. He didn't look like a good man to me. In the opening scene, he portrayed an army officer who had just found out he was going to be in charge of the 442nd Regiment, made up entirely of Japanese-American soldiers. I'm not going to be stuck with a bunch of Japs, he scoffed. I flinched. My parents' mouths tightened a bit in the flickering light. My father patted my leg. It's okay, Suze. They have to have him say that, to make it realistic. Some fellows actually did say things like that. I thought you said he was a good man. The actor is a good man. He's just playing a prejudiced guy. He patted me again. Just watch, though. He'll change. How many times have you seen this movie, I asked? He counted on his fingers. Four, five times? First, we went to the premiere. That was a big night, rascal. Van Johnson came himself. The VA sponsored it. They had a big party after. The Shudokai church cooked all kinds of nihonomono, a big cake, go for broke in the icing. They let veterans like me, Uncle Yo, Uncle Kiyoshi, all in for free. He cleared his throat and gazed into the darkness of the hallway. My mother clapped, a sharp, short noise. Hey, enough, you two. Pay attention. Parts of the movie were funny. We laughed when the soldiers played a joke on the Van Johnson sergeant. They called him Baka behind his back, and he didn't realize they were saying he was stupid. The air, hair on my arms quivered at that word. It felt like a secret swear word, and I loved that the mean officer was getting the brunt of it. A number of funny Japanese in-jokes popped up throughout the movie. I felt like I was watching people I knew, men from the church or my uncles. I had never seen my family on a screen. The 442nd soldiers were short and fast, and it made them valuable. I had heard my father say those words, 442, a hundred times. But I never understood until that night what he meant. 442, those magic numbers, hero numbers. He had told me many times how he'd fought in Italy during the war, how he'd carried a hundred pound radio on his back. He was an anomaly, a short Japanese American with a Brooklyn accent who also spoke Italian. My father told me that the 442nd was the most decorated in U.S. history. I didn't know what decorated meant, but I took it to mean they had gotten a lot of medals. Beautiful, shining decorations on their uniforms like purple hearts, ribbons, and stars. I imagined my father bejeweled and shimmering. I didn't understand that decoration equaled death, more deaths per unit than any other. I didn't understand that so many soldiers had enlisted from desert camps where they had been imprisoned with their families, from infants to elderly Issei. My parents had not told me about the Japanese-American incarceration. The Japanese on the East Coast had largely avoided that fate, and my parents were reluctant to discuss it. I didn't learn about that until I was in college. 
What I also didn't know was that my birth mother had been a child in one of those desert camps, that she had lived in barrack shacks with her siblings and parents. What I wouldn't realize until many years later was that those camps and the war were the driving factors behind my existence. My birth mother's family had lost everything, their home and business on the West Coast. They had nothing to return to when the war was over, so they took an offer to be sponsored in a tiny town in the Midwest. Their family was an anomaly, an aberration, and although they were treated kindly, they were, per they were perpetually foreign, perpetually outsiders. There were no other Japanese people to date or to marry, and given this status, it's not a surprise that my birth mother kept her private life a secret and that I, a half-white child, was the result. When I trace the events that led to my conception and birth, to my adoption and my life as I know it, I always end up coming back to that camp. I was unaware of all this watching the 442nd that night on my living room television. We watched the Japanese soldiers tricking the Germans, rescuing the lost battalion. The famous battle looked like a glorious run through the forest, leaping over logs. The ones who were shot twirled in midair and collapsed silently on the ground. Van Johnson was incredulous at what the Nisei soldiers had pulled off. I jumped on the couch, throwing pillows in the air. Go for broke, go for broke. My parents laughed, calm down, rascal. I declared it the best war movie I had ever seen. My, my heart was pumping with pride for my father. In the final scene, the American flag fluttered while FDR awarded medals to the soldiers. My mother applauded. Jozune, you did good, Ito. She picked up the dirty dishes from the, from the TV tray. I wanted to wait for, to hear you read out loud to, to just praise the incredible storytelling because you move from this thing where you're like, we're in the memory, but you're getting us in so intimately, like the fake candle. I just love the fake candle with the buttery light and you just nail the, the dialogue. I mean, I did know your mother, so I can just hear her. I can just see the clap where it was actually kind of like a little like, oh, my God, right? You know, that's enough, right? She was a little scary. She, yeah, she was like, <laughs> no business. She, I was like, no, no fooling around here kind of thing. And there's just so much of that in that section that we read. I was going to ask, how many people here did have family members that were in the 442-100th MIS? Yeah, right? And I, I, I think it's very special that this is the first time you've read that section in the dozen plus readings you've done. So I'm really appreciative that you did share that one with us. And there were so many details there, like the Inari Sushi and the, you know, just the dialogue and the jokes and the, all that. That's so J.A. So my first real question to you is, what does just growing up J.A. mean to you? Like for your experience, what does that, what did that mean? I mean, as I kind of alluded to there, it was a very half and half experience, you know, um, living, going to school, living in our town. It made, we felt very different, but then a lot of people, I think, because I'm mixed, were like, I don't even see you as Japanese. I don't see you as Asian, you know, so it was like kind of not being recognized. Um, but then the church was such a big deal for our family. And um, because it was a relatively, it was the only church in the whole tri-state area. And so people would come and spend the entire day. So we would drive in, which took an, over an hour from New Jersey, and they would have the service and then deep breath, do the service again in Japanese. And then one of the groups, the men's fellowship, youth fellowship, whoever, um, would prepare lunch for everybody, and then they would have Bible study and things in the afternoon, or we would go play basketball at the YMCA around the corner. And uh, my mother was fierce at basketball. She was like four foot ten, and she could just whoop me and put me to shame. And uh, that's <laughs> that's when she, my mother was a tough cookie. For any of you who knew her or know her, um, and she and I would uh, I was always afraid of balls. And so when I see the basketball coming toward me, I go like this, and she started calling me Chickenito. Um, she's like, "What's the matter, Chickenito? You scared of the ball?" Yes, I was scared of the ball. Um, anyway, but it was an all-day affair going to church, and so I felt very immersed in that. And then, of course, with my extended family, my cousin aunts and uncles we spent virtually every weekend with them so it was a very it was a very strange but mixed weekend on and off but I did feel very J.A. for 
for whatever that meant. I felt like it, I was in it. What about for your parents, your adoptive parents, were, which um, their names were Moss yeah. and Kiku? Yeah. Like, what do you think growing up J.A. was for them? And I know it's a weird <sighs> question because you can't really know. I mean, I, I'm going to show uh, some pictures later on, but... but. They were very, very immersed in the community. The church was very important to them from the time they were children. They met in church, they dated from church. It was like their, it was like we're all, it was like this magnet where all the Japanese Americans anywhere would like gravitate. And so I think they felt comfortable there and they felt like that's where their people were. They had, you know, the church picnics and, um, but the church community was really, really big to them. And they were also, like, they were just really connected. Like, it's like they, everybody knew everybody. And I know that, like, when I was a teenager and um, I, I wanted a, a stereo, my dad was like, okay, we'll go, we'll go and we'll get a, a special turntable from some guy who worked for Kenwood. But everybody knew everybody, and everybody was connected in a particular way. And there was another, yeah, it was just... It was very tight, very spread out, but very tight knit. Well, then you alluded, this is a question not on my paper, now I'm off-roading here. You alluded to the fact that your mom moved out to California from New Jersey in her 80s, right? And that was a big transition because obviously she's leaving that church. She's leaving that community. She doesn't know these people. And as an East Coast Japanese American, she did not experience the incarceration in the camps. Now, it wasn't that didn't mean she didn't know, but that's a big change. Can you talk a little bit? Both of you had kind of a big transition from East Coast to California West Coast. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that? Sure. Um, so I moved out after I graduated from college, and it was 1982, and I moved out here, and I was like, oh, wow, there's lots of Asian people out here. That's exciting. And I started very tentatively trying to get involved in things, and I felt really ungrounded without my parents, you know, because they had always been my entrees. Like, I followed them anywhere, and people would always accept me because it's like, oh, they're with, she's with Masan Kiku. You know, that's Masan Kiku's daughter. But without my Masan Kiku, I just felt like people didn't see me or like they didn't recognize me. I hadn't grown up in, in this community. And um, I remember I had an early job teaching at a community college and there was an Asian faculty association and I went to one of their meetings and some person, some man said, what are you doing here? And I'm like, uh, Susan Ito, you know, I'm here. And he was like, this is for Asian faculty. And I'm like, okay. So I felt like it was I was being challenged all the time and I had a hard time proving myself and it wasn't until, and and so then I was just like okay never mind this is not for me and I just don't belong here and literally it was not until I stepped into that Asian American women writers class and Patricia was a student um a young undergraduate student in that same class and I felt like we saw each other, you know, I saw her, she saw me, I, we saw all the people, all the people in the class were like, oh, and we were, we had this amazing professor, um, Karen Sue, and she taught from all over the diaspora. She was really amazing. And that class inspired me so much and gave me such a sense of home and a sense of I belong here. And it's like, oh, we're reading Asian American women writers. We are Asian American women writers. We can do this too. We can write. We can do these things. And I really feel like that was the moment that I landed here and felt like I can be part of Asian American community here. And then, you know, then then Patty, I, I was like now following Patricia around like a duckling going, okay, take me to a t cherry blossom festival or whatever. <laughs> or whatever the thing was and, and feeling like I just wasn't so lost and on my own. And then my mother came, she moved here in 2000, uh, 2001, 2002, after my father passed away and it was just too hard for her to live on her own in New Jersey. And um, so I was like, okay, you're gonna, we're gonna get you involved. So I take her to church. I took her to go-go bowling at Albany Bowl and um, I brought her to JSA quilting classes, lunches, all the things. I took her, I was just like, I got to get her 
you know, situated here and get her to meet some people. And, um, you know, at one gathering, you know, a bunch of people were like, they were very friendly, came up to her and they're like, so what camp were you in? And she was like, uh, I wasn't in camp. And literally some people did not believe her. They were like, that's not true. You know, how that, could that be? How right? could that be? That's not true. She's like, well, I'm from I'm from New York, you know, <laughs> and uh, that didn't happen in New York. And uh, um, and then people kind of like drifted away and they, they you know, and then eventually she she made a, a little group of friends that didn't care and it was fine. But I think that first um, experience really stung for her, you know, feeling like an outsider. And I know that it was so hard for many um, West Coast um, Japanese Americans that it was so hard to talk about for so long. And then all of a sudden, it's all they could talk about. And it was like, suddenly the floodgates have opened. And it's this really important bonding experience. And like, oh, you were in, you know, Tule Lake, or I was in the, wherever, you know, and, and and I think she, she felt it was really hard, and I, I really felt, um, and I remember somebody at her church said to me, your mother's really different. I'm like, I know. I know she is. They're like, she's very New York. I'm like, mm-hmm. I, I know she is. And, uh, and then so it made it harder for her, and I really um, appreciated the difference in, you know, what the experience is like. And um, you didn't ask, but I'm going to just say, so this is what my next book is about. I'm doing a historical novel about the experience of Japanese Americans in New York City during World War II. And I'm very excited about it. Yay. Yay. Uh, my next question is about writing and finding your voice. Because, I mean, as you can see, part of our relationship and part of our journey together has been about, like, reading other people's books or and then taking that to the next level, like, what do I have to say? Where's my story coming from? What are the cultural points? And I mean, again, it's like, this isn't, you know, an episode of Code Switch, but <laughs> a major part of your writing just really is about finding voice, right? And that courage to reveal it. And in your book in particular, you know, this book, there's a lot of layers of like, kind of, you know, I want to say secret. It's not so secret. It is secret. But how do you, you know, you coming to terms with that and just finding the courage to not only write it down for yourself, but then to expose it to others, including your family members um, and, and beyond, right? Because mm -hmm. this is, this is tough, right? And withholding that kind of truth. And I, I know that when you were growing up, there was kind of an awareness that this was secret or not supposed to be talked about. Um and I'm just kind of curious, like, what helped you get to that stage where you were, like, ready to start asking questions, like, out loud, not just in your head, but, like, I don't even know who to. Like, you know, was it your parents or a friend or something to just be like, hey. Oh, when I first started searching? Yeah, I mean, yeah. When not writing, searching. searching. Your, yeah. Well, it's so funny because a lot of people will comment, oh, my gosh, you were so young. A lot of adopted people um, – are like I didn't start thinking about these things or asking these questions till I was in my 30s or 40s or beyond and I really started when I was like 13 years old and it all had to do with this this um trip to the library well it actually had to do with that there's that there's a whole chapter um where my mother told me that a boy in my school my mother worked in the um, elementary school office where I went to where I went to school and so she knew all the dirt on all the kids and she so she told me she's like you know uh, this boy in your class is also adopted and I was like what you know because I really had it's like it's not like it's stamped across your head you don't know really um, necessarily and I was like oh and she said and by the way he came from the same place as you I'm like what do you mean same place as me <laughs> turns out we had been adopted by the same agency in New York City and that really piqued my interest and so I went to the town library and um, 
I was like, I'm going to read about adoption. This is an interesting thing. This is a thing that happened to me. This is about my life. So I looked up adoption and I found this book called The Search for Anna Fisher by Florence Fisher. And it was about a woman who was adopted. And she goes on this whole search for her roots and her birth certificate and her, th and she was like radical. And she started this um, organization called the Adoptees Adoptee Liberty Movement Association, ALMA. And on the back, it had a address. This is, this is our organizations. I wrote to them immediately. I was like, hell, hello, I, I want to join. And she was like, well, sorry, um, you have to be 18. And so I had to wait five years. But when I was 18, I wrote them back again, and I started going to meetings. But I really feel like it was pivotal I mean, all those things really felt stacked up. You know, it was pivotal that my mother told me about this boy and she was like, that place that you came from, I'm like, what do you, is it an orphanage? What What do you mean? And And it's like, it really started my curiosity going. And then I was like, I'm going to look it up in the library. I'm a good little nerd. And I looked it up in the card catalog and I came upon this book and the rest is history, really. Um, I have to say, this is just an aside. One, this is the most beautiful event that I have done events since November. This is the most beautifully organized, supported, uh, I mean, everything, the, the audio, the, uh, every, the snacks, everything. It's like, it's just beyond, it's beyond the scale of anything that I have done so far. I, it's incredible. So I'm very grateful. So I had this fantasy that I was going to have this amazing event in that same library in my hometown. This library has refused. Not only did they refuse to have an event, they refused to even stock my book. And it's not like they're against my book. They're just like, we don't do that kind of thing. I'm like, who are you people? <laughs> anyway, so I'm really mad. Um, <laughs> I'm really mad at the Park Ridge Library in New Jersey and um, Barnes and Noble has come through and I'm gonna do an event at Barnes and Noble. But I was just like, I was really expecting that I was going to sit there and was like going to cry. I'm like, there's the card catalog that changed my life. And librarians are the best. I've had a lot of events in libraries. And I always read that chapter when I'm in a library. Because I'm like, librarians and libraries are like incredible. And they changed my life. And I'm just like all gushy about libraries. But that particular library, bleh. Yeah. <laughs> I did not know this. This is actually, well, that is It's profound. just happened. This just happened. Because like, right, you're going to New week. Jersey next week? Yeah. And I've been trying. I have been trying to get something set up. And then finally, they're like, yeah, we don't do that kind of thing. Wow. Yeah. All right. I'm gonna that was an question. aside. I have a million questions for Susan, but I get to see her all the time. So I'm going to be able to ask them later. But for the purpose of the program today, I'm just going to move to a totally different subject now. Uh, and I'm going to read a little bit of her own writing. Um, this part just really struck me, um, again, as a Yonsei, reading this historical part of the families that are kind of coming together. And it's a little bit about choices, and it's a little bit about the consequence of some of the things that happened in their history. So Yumi's choices had l narrowed long before the day she found out that she was pregnant with me. She, they started shrinking when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, when our country went to war with a country whose people looked like her family, unquote. And then for many of us in the JA community, this wartime experience created a kind of trauma um, that can be traced to feelings of shame. Um, and it's a kind of intensely painful feeling of that we're kind of flawed and un unworthy of love. And I, as I was reading this book, I just, and I was introduced to your birth mother through your tellings, I just kept feeling that shame that she was carrying around, but you never really quite, you, know, you sort of say it, but you don't because you give her so much grace. You really do give her so much grace. I, you know, I can see her shame in the way that you're telling it. So I don't know, how how was shame in that kind of fear of embarrassment and dishonoring Ugh. present in your book? Like, how is that a thread? And it's obvious to me, but maybe not everybody, I don't know. Oh, I feel like the book is like soaking in it. You know, just like Marge, you're soaking in it. Uh, Palm Olive, um, you're soaking, you're soaking in the shame. I mean, I feel like it's everywhere, and I feel like um, they didn't talk to me a lot about it explicitly. But I think my parents, you know, felt shame in not having a child uh, for ten years, and they wanted to. Um, my cousins are. Some of them are, you know, 15, 20 years older than me. You know, it just it took them a lot longer. 
And uh, they waited and waited and waited and waited, and finally I came along, and that, that was that was what they got offered. So here here we are. Um, and I, I, I think that they were very um, stoic about that, but I know that it wasn't easy. So they, there was their shame. And then, of course, my birth mother, um, she never told her parents, never told her siblings, never told anybody else. Um, and I think the shame was really, really deep and continues to be. I think it continues to, I think it just, it wasn't just at the moment when I was born, it was like f forever after, uh, continuing. Um, and then I, I, I was thinking, because we talked about this a little bit the other day, but I have felt a lot of shame in even telling the story and feeling like my own shame around, I shouldn't, why do I need to do this? You know, or what? The story is just pathetic. I'm so needy. Why am I so needy? You know, and just like, why do I need these things that I, that I need? And just really like not giving myself any grace around it. And it was, it's been like, so, and that's like, why did this book take 30 years? Because it was me like alligator wrestling with the shame. And alleg it wasn't like the writing didn't take that long. It was like going back and forth, like, is it okay if I tell a story? And I was really ashamed of it. I was ashamed of it. I was ashamed of having to tell it. I was ashamed of my place in it. I was ashamed of being somebody else's secret. I was ashamed of being somebody that, you know, other people couldn't acknowledge. You know, that was really, that was really hard. And so I, I was, I think, complicit in that for many decades of like, okay, you want me to say that I don't exist? Okay, fine. I won't. And so I, I think I feel like it's you know that intergenerational trauma and intergenera intergenerational shame. I feel like it really did trickle down. And this book is you know I don't know. I, I can't tell you the day that I turned in the last manuscript and they were like, "This is it. No more. No more. No more. Nothing. No more. No more editing. No more anything." I just I felt so sick and so sick. Yeah, yeah, with worry about what this was going to do. So, in a in a related thing too, though, be this book. I mean, I hope everybody's read this because I'm not going to give spoiler alerts. But there is so much stuff in here that is very difficult to witness, right? I mean, again, we're watching and seeing all this happen, and those those are because they they're so raw and they're also not good situations. Um, I, and I just have questions for you about like writing that kind of unflattering story, those mm. kinds of stories that are just, that are kind of shameful, right? They're like, this is not the way you wanted it to happen. This was super painful. Mm -hmm. Like, did you, did you start by writing it because you just needed to write it mm. Um, mm. to get this down on paper? And then you realized it had to be connected into the final book. I mean, I'm kind of curious about like, Writing to tell the story just so it's healing, and then what you decide has to stay, right? Mm -hmm. Because it could be very unflattering to people, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of it um, I wrote in real time in journals. Um, a lot of it, especially like the day that I met her, I knew that if I didn't write it down, I was going to have some sort of out-of-body experience, and I would forget, or I would... It, it, I would lose it somehow. So I forced myself, you know, that night I came back to where I was staying and I just wrote down as much as I could remember. And a lot of them, like I've been part of a lot of groups who write together and do free writing. And a lot of these things would just be like, this happened this week. You know, I, I, I this was really heavy. This happened this week and I got to write about it. And so then it, the, the, those were all in very rough states but i i picked on a lot of those to use and also to kind of reality check myself you know because memory is a funny thing and like a lot of times i'd be like oh i remember this and i'd look back and like no susan that's not how it was uh, you know? and i'd have to you know revise it All right um I was going to pause and ask did you want to read an excerpt again or should we keep with questions Read okay. another excerpt. What? Oh, my, my coach here says uh, to read from when I met her. Okay. That's, <laughs> this is from the very beginning. Okay. Yeah, this is really short. It's the very first chapter, and it's also where the title of the book comes from. I would meet you anywhere. 
My clog squeaked in the snow as I approached the Holiday Inn in an unfamiliar wintry city. I searched the lobby for an Asian woman, but didn't see one. Was she already here? Was she going to show up as planned? Or had she bailed on me, reenacting the ghosting of two decades ago? Oh, this is when I was 20. Um, the note in my pocket just said, Holiday Inn, noon on Saturday, room under the name Noguchi. I sidled into the restroom to brush my hair and practice making a cheerful, intelligent, sensitive, mature face in the mirror. At 20 years old, I was still sometimes mistaken for a middle schooler. Suddenly, my outfit of jeans, mock turtleneck, sweater, and chunky clogs seemed wrong. Too casual? Too college student? I was a college student, but maybe I should have dressed up more. Hi, I said to my reflection. Hello. I'm Susan. Hello. I arranged my face into a variety of expressions, smiling, solemn, in between. I pushed back a tsunami of anxious tears. Then it was time. I walked through the lobby to the hotel's front desk and spoke her surname, our name, my original name from the papers my adoptive parents had wrangled out of a county, county clerk only months ago, Noguchi. Room 1211, she's expecting you, said the red-haired clerk. He pointed toward a bank of elevators. The doors pinged open on the 12th floor, and I edged slowly down the hallway. I paused in front of each door, 1207, 1209. I stopped in front of 1211. My watch read 1158. I brushed the fake wood laminate door with my knuckles. Time ticked like a tiny bomb on my wrist. Two minutes to 12, 120 seconds. I stood with my palm against the door, watching the hand sweep its way around once, twice, a little blade slicing away at the time. I recited a little rhyme in my head. I would meet you in a house. I would meet you with a mouse. I would meet you in a room. I'd meet you at exactly noon. At five seconds to 12, my hand curled into a loose fist and knocked twice. Then I stepped back, breathing hard. The door opened. I half expected a blinding light and that I would step over the threshold into an abyss. But on the other side was an ordinary hotel room and a Japanese woman my height stood in the doorway. She was my birth mother. I took in her ink black hair, razor straight, with a sharp line of bangs above her eyebrows. No pin curls or foam rollers for her. No beauty parlor perms like my adoptive mother. My heart pinched thinking about that mother, oblivious back in New Jersey. I blinked and stared again at the soft rounded blip of her nose, her full lips. She wasn't smiling. Her eyes took me in. Then she spoke. You must be Susan. Her voice sounded professional. Yes. She stepped aside to let me pass. I hope you don't mind that we've met here. Oh no, not at all. A giggle bubbled up from my gut and once again my mind rhymed. I would meet you in a car. I would sit inside a jar. I would meet you anywhere. I hear that and I also think about your, one of your campaigns where you did a series of photographs where you <laughs> Standing on a log and <laughs> oh, that was my book on car. Boxing. Right, it was <laughs> right. Yes. Um, and it just again, like I'm just so reminded of what a great writer you are. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I kind of want I want to leave space and time for people to ask questions. So I'm going to ask my last question now. I think, and that is, again, as a writer, is the book that you turned into the publishing company the book that we are reading today? Well, ultim ultimately, yes. Um, but at first, I turned in a book that was 110,000 words. And they said, this is very nice, Susan, but our books tend to be 60,000 words. So could you please cut 50,000 words? And I did. Um, it's um, uh, There's a lot that's left out. And some of it pains me that I had to leave it out. And some... I feel really good that it's not in there, and I feel like it's a it's a very clean book. My my new agent that I just got, she's like, your book is so tight. I really like that about your book. It's so tight. I'm like, it better be, you know. <laughs> I had to cut fifty thousand words from it. Um, so yeah, that's the answer to that question. <laughs> All right. Um, like, like I said, I want to make space for other people to have dialogue, but I know that you also prepared a slideshow for yes. us to kind of end our our part of the program. Yeah. These um, photos 
are directly correlated to some of the chapters in the book. So if you've read the book, you'll be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe she's got a picture of that, the exact same thing. Um, and some of it is like a little bit of background and I, it's kind of skewed uh, JA for this audience. Okay, so these are my parents. Moss and Kiku, this is before Susan. <laughs> this is before me. My dad was also an incredible photographer, and some of his photos are just amazing. Um, but this is them in New York in their younger days, so I think right after they got married. Um, and this is their life in... Um, in New York, um, what the, the photo on the top left is just these styling uh, Japanese American ladies walking down the street in New York City. Um, on the top right is the church. You know, it was, that was like the whole church. And my mom is circled in red. She was just a little tyke then. Um, her father owned a uh, Japanese restaurant called Nico, and there she is um, with one of the waitresses in her little kimono, and she was, uh, at six years old, she was the cashier, and um, uh, yeah, the, I think they were going to get her parents in trouble for child labor, but uh, it was a family affair, and um, there's my dad holding the dog um, on the bottom right, and they spent a lot of time at the beach, either the Jersey Shore or Jones Beach or Coney Island. Um, they were big beach people. Um, so there's my dad in the, his 442nd uniform. There he is just when he comes back with my mom. And there he is at the um, first uh, Red Cross lemonade stand in Italy. And that's my mom uh, shortly after I came to them. Uh, so this is my family um, growing up. Um, this is my cousins on the top left at my birthday party. Um, there's my mom and grandma and I um, in, uh, visiting uh, her, my grandma's relatives in Japan when I was 10 years old. Uh, there's me and my aunties on Mother's Day. Um, and there's my grandmother um, and me on the bottom on a family vacation. So this was my social worker uh, who came and brought my brought me to my parents. Her name was really Crystal Breeding, which I find crazy. <laughs> Not a joke, but my dad kept this photo in his wallet like my whole life. The whole time I knew him, he just this was like such a moment for him. Um, I, th th this was after I had come to them and she was coming to check up, see how I was doing. Um, so this is us. And, you know, it, I think another thing is when you're adopted and you don't look like your family, um, I think it brings up questions a lot earlier when people have questions about, like, what are you doing with them? Is that really your mother? Is that really your dad? Um, so I think um, questions came up a lot earlier than they do for some people. Uh, for, for those of you who read it, and I had an incident where I was a waitress in a Japanese restaurant, and one of the um, customers rudely declared that uh, if he wanted to be served by someone who looked like me, he would have gone to McDonald's, and he wanted a real Japanese waitress. So, that was, so there, there I am, right in front of their restaurant. <laughs> Uh, this was another uh, chapter called the mouse room, and that's one of the mice. I worked in a mouse laboratory. I was the mouse caregiver, and they they had no immune system, so they had no fur. And so that's me and one of my little one of my little Nezumi. Um, so another one. This is a friend of mine from our church, uh, Ken Shiotani, and I went and stayed with him the night before I went to my first adoption meeting. And here I am in his funky little apartment in in Greenwich Village, and I was just so excited. And it's like, yeah, that was the night before it all started. Yeah, right. Um, there's another chapter in the book called Totaled, and it's about how I have a bad car accident when my birth mother happens to be in town. And uh, she comes and uh, helps me out after after the accident. Um, bowling was such a big part of my mom's life. Um, she, they were bowling from the time she was um, a teenager um, in New York City, and they were always part of a Japanese bowling league. And then she was bowling here. That the second one is in Albany Bowl um, when she moved out here. So bowling was really big for her. 
Um, this is our multi-generational family, my husband, my two daughters, and my mom, and uh, they became really, really close with her, and I was really grateful that we had seven times, so 17 years together after she moved out with us. There's Joe, <laughs> extending connections, and just how JSA extending connections and Berkeley Methodist United Church really became her new community here, um, which was not easy after um, you know moving here after so long, but they really did make a home for her. Thank you, JSA. Thank you, Joe. Um, so. I uh, later on, this is kind of a spoiler, but I did find my birth father's family through um, DNA testing and um, his, he had passed away at the time um, a couple of years before I met them, uh, but his sister, my aunt, welcomed me in incredibly warmly and, okay, this is like one of the only audiences where I'll show anything identifying, but I just, that's him and that's me with my unibrow, just like his when I was in fifth grade. And then <laughs> there's a scene in the book and, and just, so cranes and origami have a, there's a, it's a big symbolic theme in the book and as it turns out that their last name was Crane. And so at the end of my visit with them, meeting them for the first time, I was like, okay, I'm going to teach the cranes how to make cranes. And I um, taught them that and they were really, they were really tickled. Uh, this is when uh, in the year 2000, I got my original birth certificate certificate for the first time when New York State opened up its um, records. They had been sealed and they're still sealed in 23 states where people, no matter how old they are, cannot get, cannot see their own birth certificates. So I, did, I got mine when I was 60 years old. Uh, this was um, one of the last chapters in the book when um, I had my first grandchild and it was during the pandemic, it was 2020. And um, we had to uh, introduce her through the window um, of, of the care home she was living in, but we did get to have one uh, four generation picture. So I wanted to quickly circle back again that JSA had um, a book club and they read your book. And I did want to just, there were a couple observations that came to uh, me through, via Jill, but I also wanted to invite anyone the book club in particular to ask any questions in the audience in general. Um, but, you know, the book club really enjoyed your book and almost everyone in the group had a personal connection to adoption, either firsthand or through a friend or a relative. And so they could sympathize with all of the perspectives in this book. And another observation that I thought was important was that they really felt like your parents, Moss and Kiku were just warm, supporting loving parents. I love the part where you're like, okay, mom, I'm going to ask you some questions about my, you know, about my birth mom. And your mom says, what, what took you so long? long? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> in that tone or in that accent, right? In that accent, in, in that, that tone. Accent. Yeah. So I guess I want to first open it to anyone who did read the book through the book club. Do you guys have questions for Susan? Hey, Susan, I'm Rosa. I loved your book so, so much. Um, I've said this to you before, but I just want to say it here as well, that I just found your book incredibly honest and vulnerable and powerful and beautiful. It has continued to stay with me. I miss hearing your story now. I think one of the saddest things about the book was that it ended. I would love the uh, 60,000 words that you had to cut out. I would welcome that. Um, but you know, one of the things you talked about earlier here was just kind of the shame. And I, I mean, that definitely felt very heavy throughout the entirety of the book. Um, and it, it just made me think so much of your voice and your story and how you were just like bulldozing through all of it. And I thought, wow, here's this kid who's just being incredibly courageous and resilient. I mean, so resilient through all of the ups and downs and I guess just kind of this theme of shame like I'm just you know I know that this is a lifelong journey it sounds like there's still stuff out in the universe but I wonder now looking back now that the book is published now that you've shared it with so many of us kind of where does shame fit into this whole narrative for you now mm. 
Thank you, Rosa. Um, that's such a good question. I mean, I think one of the things that I wasn't expecting, but really has shocked me is I've gotten so much incredible feedback about the book that made me feel like, oh, maybe it wasn't so pathetic after all. Like maybe this wasn't a terrible thing. You know, maybe I wasn't a terrible person. Maybe, you know what I mean? Like all the things that you're just, you have so much self doubt or, you know, as a writer, but also as a human, you know, I really felt like people were going to judge me and be like, why don't you leave that poor one alone? What's wrong with you? I mean, I really, and I worry about that, you know? Um, but I think it's really given me a lot of um, strength and a lot of encouragement that this was the right thing to do, ultimately. Thank you. No, I just wanted to say you're, the way you write is in the dialogue is really amazing um especially the uh i want to say scene but it wasn't a scene um but you painted such an amazing picture of being in the doctor office in the panic like i feel like my heart was racing reading it <laughs> my eyes couldn't read fast enough just to see like do you make it out <laughs> without them catching you um it was it was really good just everything about it yeah thank you i appreciate it that was that was like more of a comment than a question. Question. Um, Paulo's here. Hi, Paulo. Um, that was one of the key scenes, and it was a scene in my solo performance show, The Ice Cream Gene. And I actually like performed that on stage where I was like, <laughs> you know, like I'm at the gynecologist's office and I'm thinking, what am I going to do? And it was one of the most, I, I, I don't know, it, it is, it, it, it's a scene. It's a scene already. And looking back, I'm like, I cannot believe I did that. But it changed everything, right? So if you don't know what she's talking about, there's a scene in a doctor's office that it's a scene. <laughs> and this was a question about Yumi. Yumi, this is your birth mother. Um, did she ever talk about her camp experience? Like, did she ever share that part of her history with you? she shared that it happened and she she reflected on it saying it wasn't so bad we were just kids we were running around we were actually having kind of a good time and it was a lot harder for the adults but for us kids like you know we it was like being at camp camp you know we get to hang out with each other we had a community um but i sent her your book the all we could carry yeah i say yes and i i would periodically send her books or things that i thought would resonate for her. Um, I sent her the, uh, the, re the, 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 re the Resist book, um, Tomiko's book. Um, anyway, I would, pr I would, and she would always be really grateful, like, thank you, for, it's giving me something to think about. It's, you know, and just really recently, just this year, she expressed that she really wanted to go on a pilgrimage. And I was like, wow, wow, that's big. But she just, you know, she wasn't sure if she could, she could handle it. Um, you know, physically. Um, so I think it's like over the years it took an opening, but I think it also reflected the opening in the community itself that people talking about it, she went to see Allegiance, um, George Takei's, and I think just like having these things out there in the culture was a real opening for her to think about it. At first, no. And that's why my half sister and I, we went on pilgrimage. We went on Tule Lake pilgrimage because we wanted to learn more and because um, she hadn't really told either one of us that much. So that, that was a really key experience. Right. And it's consistent the way that you describe in the book, though, that for a very long time, you just let her tell you what she was going to tell you. And you wouldn't ask like, oh, tell me about what happened to your family during the war? Like oh. that wasn't the kind of relationship you had. Yeah, true. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty much the way it always was. Just I'll take whatever you're going to tell me. OK. Um, there was another question that, that um, I heard from the book club that I was resonated for me, too, which was a general question about names and how like name is OK. I'm, I'm reading their question and trying to work this out. So they are asking about names influencing one's identity. And there mm -hmm. is a part of your book where you, of course, you you were born and then you 
were adopted and your adoptive parents gave you the name Susan, Susan Kiyo Ito, but you learned that there was another name. Mm. Um, and I guess that my interpretation of the question that was submitted was how did that, inf- how did that influence your identity to know that you had two names? Oh yeah. Um, I think this is common for a lot of adoptive people who learn that they, you know, had an original name at birth. It's like it's a real sliding doors kind of moment. It's like what would that, who would that person have been if that person had kept that name and and kept that life and that experience? What if they had and it's sort of I, I say at some point, you know, just like the incredible randomness of it, like it was sort of random that I ended up with my parents. I mean, and I had this very, very specific particular experience that I feel honestly very grateful for. But I could have I could have ended up anywhere. I could have ended up with Irish people. I could have ended up who knows where. You know, you just don't know. And and just like how random that is. I could have been like Susie McDonough or something, you know, I could have been all kinds of things. Um, so I think that's, that's, that's one of the things. And then I think, yeah, you can read a chapter about my name if you read it. I think the other part of the question was, um, your half sister sharing yeah. that same name. Yeah, that's what, that, that's what I was alluding to. And I was like, yeah, read the book about that. Yes. When I found out that my half sister had been given that name, um, you know, three, four years after I was born, and I found that out the day that I met my birth mother, I was devastated, you know? And it's like, maybe that's, there's so many ways to interpret that, right? It could be like, oh, it was an homage to you, to remember you, it was this, it was all, like, I don't know, but for me, I felt erased. And I felt like, oh, well, I don't know. It It was really hard because for the few months that I knew about the name, I was kind of like trying it on, like, oh, I had this other name. It was kind of pretty. Oh, you know, and then it just felt like it was torn away, you know. And I really don't know what the intent was or what that was all about, but it was it was shocking for me, that moment. Just, I just wanted to say thank you so much for writing the book, uh, which Patricia lent to me and my wife, and we both read it, and uh, the biggest reaction we had was, we're mad at your birth mother. But my question is, as we're reading the book, as I'm reading the book, I'm thinking, this needs to be made into a movie. So the question is, when's the movie coming out? <laughs> OK, I'm going to tell you. So I just got an agent, right? She's a great agent. She's a big agent. And I said, oh, you know, I just have this fantasy that there's going to be a movie and George Takei will be my dad. And she was like, oh, we can get a hold of his agent. We'll send him a copy of the book. And I was like, OK, so we'll see. We'll see. That's my that's my personal fantasy is that, that George, Uncle George will be my dad. He'll be Masito. Well, the book's in audio book form, too, already. Yeah, it is. It is. Were you part of that experience at all? No, I. Um, so the Mouse Room was published as a quote unquote mini memoir several years ago, and I narrated that. And it was the most grueling, uncomfortable experience of my life. For one, if any of you were reading along as I was reading, you'll notice that I change things as I read because I'm like, I don't like that sentence. I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna edit it as I'm talking. I love to do that because it really feels like it's never done and it's never quite perfect. Um, you're not allowed to do that when you do audiobook. You have to read it exactly. And so every time I would say the instead of a, a they would be like back two sentences. I'm like, oh. And then they make you drink a lot of water and you're like, <laughs> you know, they're like, your, your mouth is making sounds again. Drink water. And I'm like, oh, my God, are we ever going to be done with this? So it was maybe 30 pages. It took like four hours. And they said that to do you know, this book length thing would take over 20 hours. And I just didn't think I was up for it. You know, I was like, I can't do this. I don't like doing it. I know it's not my voice. Um, and I'm, I actually had made friends with this Asian uh, audio narrator um, on Twitter. And I, we, I, she just seemed like a cool person. I'm like, hey, can you tell me about audio narrating? And um, anyway, so she did a 15-minute um, uh, audition for me. And my husband, John, uh, 
cried when he heard it. I'm like, hey, I think that's a good sign. And uh, so I hired her and um, I was really happy. Some people who I know or who know me are like, she, it, she doesn't sound like you at all. I'm like, I know she doesn't, but it's okay. You know, for people who listen to audiobooks, I think she, she did a good job. I'm happy she did it. Thank you. I have so many mixed feelings, but the first thing I wanted to say is thank you so much for uh, being real. Uh, as a third generation, uh, as a sansei, I think I grew up being feeling, um, how should I say it? I was kind of a rebel in my family, and it was always kind of, um, you know, um, I'm saying too much already. But, you know, Joe, oh, it's just Joe. You know, she, she says things like that and stuff. But what I got the most out of your book, the feeling is the love that you expressed for your parents and their love for you. Because as a, a Japanese American, we did not use words like I love you. We heard do your best and you know, you did a good job, but this love was never put in words. And so when I read your book, I cried a lot because knowing you and your mom, especially your mom, how much she loved you and um, you could do wrong. She said, you know, my Susan was, <laughs> You, you know, you have her in the book, you characterize her um, scolding you, and I could hear her voice, you know. But the love that um, they expressed to you and you expressed to them is something that I wish I had been able to do for my own parents. So I'm just telling everybody else, it, um, I'm, I'm not telling you what to do, but I'm just saying that it. I don't have any woulda, shoulda, couldas too much in my life, but that's one of my uh, woulda. <laughs> Thank you, Thank Joe. You. Thank you so much. It's so true, and I was one of those um, young Asian American people who was like, my parents never said I love you. And I was like all about it. And it was a thing. It's a thing to complain about that. But then now it's like thinking about it, it's like, oh boy, they said it in so many ways. And I have been in touch with so many adopted people. And I can't tell you how many people, other adoptees, are shocked at my parents' response, which was, what took you so long and how can we help you? Immediately. They were right there. How can we help? What do you want us to do? And they came and they met my birth mother and they, you know, stayed friends with her. And they were just like so open hearted and so matter of fact about it. They weren't like, you know, they weren't martyry about it or anything. And they weren't like, why do you need to find somebody else? You know, they were just like, what do you need? Of course. And I took that for granted. Um, but that was the way that they really showed me love, and I've heard so many stories of it being otherwise. So I have come to really appreciate that a lot, and all the ways they showed love for me in nonverbal ways. Thank you. The question is that right now um, in, well, in the society of poets and writers that I um, spend time with, there's a very it, it, there's a, um, a very strong desire and need to tell the story, to tell their stories, our stories, okay. which is what you know you've clearly done in this book. And I guess I'm just wondering how you uh, what you see as the importance of that, um, and. If, you know, if writing this book has changed you, I mean, you've, you've talked about it a little bit, but I just feel like way back when Janice Mirikatani wrote Breaking the Silence, that with um, Japanese folks, it's been really hard to tell stories. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I mean, I've had really difficult time getting information out of my own family. <laughs> like, who is that person? 
<laughs> um, so anyways, I'm just asking what you see as, as, as the importance or the need or, or what do you think that fulfills in people's lives? Uh, oh, I think it's, I think it's so important. And I, well, there's like the internal need of one has to tell one's own story, but there's the external need of like the community to hear these stories and for other communities to hear our stories. Like I've, I've been amazed at how many people have written to me or said things to me about our situation is very, very different, but there was something that really resonated for them. Like they're not adopted, they're not Japanese American, they're not this, that, or the other thing, but they really felt this connection. And I feel like all these stories are so human and that we're connecting as, as humans with our own struggles and our own drives and all of our things. I, I feel like they're really important. I, I think for me, well, I as I said, it took 30 years to get this thing out. Um, and I think I had very, very modest expectations. Like I was like, uh, I don't know who's going to publish it at all, if ever. I don't know what's going to happen to it. And if I have 100 readers who are all my friends, that's fine. Do you know what I mean? I didn't have like, I wasn't be like, I must be on the New York Times bestseller list, or I must have this, that, or the other thing. I just didn't have huge expectations. So I think that helped. It's just like, I just need to get it out. I need to get it out there and to say I finished it. It's a, it's a thing in the world. And so I, I think that helps, you know, to just be like, you're not telling a story to be famous, but to get the story out and to share it with people. You know, I think, I think those are the most important things. Oh, and I wanted to say this way in the beginning, but I wanted to, I just wanted to acknowledge that this, this little humble book, um, and this book that Patricia illustrated so beautifully, we're both finalists for the National Book Critics Circle Award for 2023. And while we did not win, it is an honor just to be nominated. And it's huge. And one of my friends is like, do you know the odds of that? I'm like, no. And she's like, it's 52,000 to one. That those are the, those are the, name, the number of books that came out in 2023. And she's like, it's incredible that these books got nominated. So I just wanted to give some kudos to Moss, Masumoto, and to Patricia, who I know that that nomination was largely in part to her incredible art and, and my book. And I was just like so excited that we were both nominated together. So, uh, but that was something I was not expecting at all here. I thought this was going to be the most fly under the radar book ever. Um, so anytime anybody reads it, I'm shocked and delighted. And I think that's the thing with, you know, just write, just get it out there, share it with like two people and then share it with a few more people and share it with a few more people. And, you know, then you'll kind of, you'll get that encouragement, you know, from other people that your words mean something. Mm -hmm. I, I was just so stunned that two Japanese Americans this right. year were, were nominated and it really means a lot. I mean, again, like it's, you know, okay, uh, there are a lot of writers of color who were nominated in the whole across the board for this award, but still, I mean, the odds, right? And that, that was California, big. That they the were California books by Japanese American writers writing about family secrets. That's right. What Both about that? About family secrets. What about memoir. that? Yeah. And Susan's first book, I'm sorry, but come on. <laughs> I wanted to say that I feel like I, I don't have a connection to adoption itself, but I did really resonate with that need for belonging and also like that feeling of being at the mercy of someone else in terms of just really wanting their love and it kind of being in their power. Um, I was just curious if you felt comfortable talking more about what it felt like to meet your aunt. That was such a powerful part for me. I cried. <laughs> um, but I was just curious if it felt like you know, I'm just meeting you, but I feel like I've always known you if you had that family connection or if you could talk about that experience a little bit more. Yeah, we do. Um, that was an incredible, I mean, for any of you who've read it or you will read it, um, meeting my aunt on my birth father's side, literally within 10 seconds of being on the phone, she said, welcome to the family. And my birth mother had never said that. She was like, I know you always want to be part of this family, but you're not. You know, I mean, I think she really was always holding me at arm's length and being like, you 
are so lucky to have your parents. You're so lucky to have your family. And to have this other person be like, welcome, you know, has been amazing. And yeah, so she, um, I met her in 2017. She passed away in 2019. It was like two years just like, like jam-packed with love and connection. She called me like three times a week and it was just amazing. Um, and then after she died, I was really worried that nobody was going to um, feel about me the way that she did. And uh, she had a cousin. She had a cousin named Jeannie, a younger cousin, and Jeannie took on the baton. And she would like continue to call me and she would always say, we're so happy you're in our family. We're so happy you found us. We love you so much. And I got to be with her in February um, as I was doing book tour. And it was just so wonderful to be with her and all these cousins who also embraced me like crazily. Um, anyway, she just passed away this morning. Jeannie. Um, and that, that family just has meant so much to me, you know. And I had always kind of like, because my parents are Nisei, I always sort of like pushed aside that part of my family, like, oh, you know, the Japanese part. That's like, I, I just really resonated because that's all I knew growing up, you know. But these, um, you know, these, these white people from the Midwest have just really showed up for me in a way that um, I was never expecting. I really loved your book too. Um, I was, when I was reading your book, I just was a little angry at your mom, your birth mom, uh, because um, you could have met your your father while he was alive, and so that, that was really, I mean, it just really, really hit me here. So. Yeah. Um, well, join the club. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of people who feel that way and you know I really would want people to come out of the book feeling compassion for her and her kind of impossible situation you know and I talk about the legacy of the camps and then being in this tiny town where she's completely culturally and racially isolated and then having this unexpected pregnancy and having to hide it I mean, I just, I feel like, I feel the weight of that. I feel the weight of that, and while I don't, I well, I wish it was different, I really wish it was different, I understand it, and I feel, I have a, a real deep compassion for her, um, but I've been mad at her a lot, and, and sad. I mean, the whole situation has made me mad and sad. And sad for her, I'm sad for, you know, my children who didn't really get to know her as a grandmother, I'm sad for her that she didn't have these wonderful grandchildren in her life and other people. And that, you know, it could have been much more open and um, expansive, but it wasn't. So I know you're not the only one to say that. I've heard it before. Thank you. My question to you is, um, overall, I thought that the book from a Japanese American perspective, especially my mom is, you know, straight from Japan and really set in her ways about how I should be as a person, you know, it's very by the law, by strict rules. Um, I felt um, it's obligation. Um, I felt that throughout the book is obligation. And um, your birth mother, you know, I was wondering, you know, when you showed up at her door, she had this obligation, you know, that she has to be with you and meet with you and and fill this role for you. And then when you, your mother became older and you had to be a caregiver for her, you know, it's this obligation. And I think that Japanese Americans um, have this sense of, you know, of obligation of doing what's what you have to do, what you think is right. And I was wondering what your thoughts on that is, if maybe. Um, obligation, definitely. I think it played a big part. Um, and I wonder, that's so interesting that you said that because when, um, you know, I, I, it just popped into my head. Um, whenever there was like a, a, a period of disconnection or um, no contact with my birth mother for a long time, I would always send her chocolate. 
And I'm like, that's going to bring her back. And it always did because she was like not a person who could ever receive something without acknowledging it with a thank you note, right? She loved C's chocolate. And so I would like, I'd be like, okay, I, I haven't heard from her while. This is going to, this is going to get her. And it always did. And I think it was like, I, I felt like I could rely on that sense of obligation. Um, I, I don't think that was exactly what you were talking about, but I think it did play a part. And I think, um, yeah, it's just like, it's sort of like the shame part and it's sort of like the community part. It's just like it's interwoven. It's just in there. It's definitely part of all of our experience. Thank you so much for sharing. And I, I know you know, it's like being a caregiver is is hard. But I have to say also, I would take it back in a second if I could do it again. You know? Yeah. No, I, when you're in it, it's hard to feel that way. Do you know what I mean? But now it's like, oh, gosh, if, you know, call me with your little bell, you know? Let, let me let me clean up. I'll do it, you know? But, you know, you can only say that when you've been missing it for a long time. When you met your birth mother, one of the parts that, like, just broke my heart was when she said she's so angry she was so angry with you and I think we see the the upset the anger from her throughout the entire book right um and maybe still to this day who knows mm. but I think one of the the hardest things and I think you've heard it from a couple folks is I think us trying to get in her mind and trying to understand her perspective um, and I think you do such really a masterful job of like giving her so much grace. And even now, like you want us to give her grace. Right. And I think it's hard for us. Right. Because we're so bound to you and to your parents and to your story. But I wonder, because as I was reading the book, I thought, what is going to happen when this book is published? She has been holding on to this arm's length you're not part of our family not wanting to tell anybody not wanting you to tell anybody like just right wanting you to just accept what she gives you no questions asked which i think you have done for obviously a very significant part of your life but i guess my question is now the book is out is she i mean is she still going to hold on so tightly to the to this like notion of you're not part of my family oh. right like i mean is like what you you mentioned when you turned in the manuscript you, for the final time you felt sick mm. you felt sick why was it because of her reaction primarily or yeah. what you're nodding a lot so i want to know what all the nods oh, are I'm, I'm, I'm nodding and i'm spurting and making all kinds of noises yeah, um, yeah, I felt sick because I felt like this could be it. This could be the final, this could be the nail in the coffin here, literally. Um, and it's like, am I ready to give this up, like, permanently? I mean, we've been going back and forth and back and forth for decades. Am I ready to lose this relationship for the sake of this book? And I was like, I just got to jump. I mean, I felt like I was jumping, I was cliff diving. I felt like I was jumping off a cliff. And um, I have not heard from her s since I told her about the book. I told her about the book in August, and uh, I haven't heard from her since. Um, so I don't know if she's read it. I didn't say, I hope you read it. I hope you don't read it. I haven't said, I didn't say anything. I just said, I, I just want to let you know it's out there. I did my best to keep your anonymity. I've changed names. I've changed places. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, so I don't know. At this point, we're not in contact. And um, and it's okay. You know, I really feel like really what I want for us both is to be at peace. And that's what I said in my note to her is I, I really wish us peace going forward. And I think my greatest fear is that there's this, she's just a person, she's just a human. And that I kind of ruined her life, you know, or, or, you know, or like from her perspective, like I think about the perspective of herself, her family, 
and they're like, oh my God, what has Susan done? What has she done? And, and this is the worst thing that I could have done. It's the worst, be, beyond the pale. And I did it. And I think, you know, if I was them and I had seen how much she had, you know, struggled with this over the years, I would be really angry at me. You know, everyone's angry at her, but I, they're, I think they're really angry at me. And I, I, I fear that people are sending her this book. She's an avid reader. It's like, look, it's this book by this Japanese American girl, <laughs> woman, person, author. And you know, and the people are like sending it to. I don't. I don't mean. I have no idea what's going on. I have no idea if she's read it. Um, I just hope that she's not suffering too much over it but but it's like what you said it was like the idea that reading this book would make her feel more like i'm her family i don't think so i mean i don't think so uh, for a long time i would see that there would be this break when susan pushed the margin a little bit to find her birth father and there would be frankly some depression that could go on and the book would get dropped it would be six months or a year and Gradually, at some point, she would get back to it, uh, and I knew I, well. I knew her birth mother pretty well, uh, and a very nice, presentable, very socially very good person. It felt very real, uh, but a bit controlled. And um, I was angry with her. I felt it was power uh, that she that the power of the secret that she enjoyed the power of the secret. For I haven't felt that way for a number of years now, maybe the last five or 10 years, or maybe in the process of getting the book out. You think about the city, I think it's a matter of the shame. I think she was a young woman, the only person of color in this little town in the Midwest in the 1950s when this happened. And I grew up in the 1950s, as a lot of you know, this was not okay. Plus, she was an outsider. It was, quote, out of wedlock. The, and she was the only Japanese, short, not too long after the war, the only Japanese in the whole state. Plus her family, I'm sure, would have been, she never told them. I don't think, I think when she said, I haven't thought about you in 20 years, she meant it. The, the, the uh, agency told her, you never have to think about this. It's over. You this is not your child anymore. And she moved on for all these multiple reasons, being Japanese, being alone, being 1950s in a Christian Midwest community, um, having done, you know how shameful this was. And I think her reaction to it was, this didn't happen. I don't accept it. She's going to go to her grave because of these cultural things, some combined with her own personality, but it's not something to, she has no choice in this, you know? And, and so I, I, I don't know if I feel her, but I feel like I understand her and she would never talk about any of it. But I think there's a part of her that just subconsciously and to some extent consciously, this is not acceptable. I don't accept it. It never happened. I'm never going to acknowledge it. And she's going to die that way. You know, but it's not something to criticize her for. I think it's understandable in a culture. Anyhow, that's sort of the thing I came to over many years of being, because Susan would always be so vulnerable to this, of being like, what is wrong with this woman? You know, and being, but I, I don't think that's what it's about. One of the things I really liked was you brought out the position when adoption happens, all these people, that's involved, and I think your reaction to your birth mother, your birth mother's reaction to you, I really did feel sorry for her because I lived through the 50s, and I lived in a place where there was a Japanese community. She was alone, and in a way, she was lucky she was alone because it happened in a Japanese community and word spread like wildfire and people just the poor girl she wasn't I, I don't think she was 18 you know but she was just kind of like stigmatized stigmatized yes mm. and many 
families wouldn't let their daughters associate with her and stuff like that. Yeah. But with Yumi, in a way, she was fortunate that she could keep it away from other people. Mm. And she found a way to do that. Mm. But I really sympathize with her because in those days, I mean, you know, there's no Roe versus Wade or none of that stuff. No. It was just, you're supposed to be this virgin girl or woman, you know, until you get married. Mm -hmm. And it was very, very sad, yeah. you know. And we even had a couple, uh, most people in our community, they were either gardeners or house cleaners. And apparently this one woman had, uh, you know, relationship with the boss of the place and she got pregnant and she kept the child and the child looked very different, of course, and everybody kind of, you know, raised their eyebrows or anything, but, you know, I see that she was strong, mm -hmm. and because uh, I guess she could have put the child up for adoption. I don't know, mm. but even that was, I mean, unheard of because right away it was because uh, the woman wasn't married or right. the man was already married, and in her case, that was just. Yeah, right. there's there's so many cultural forces that really, really impact this situation. Yes. So it yeah. Does. Yeah. So I mean I yes, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. But anyway, I really enjoyed your book and thank you. As I said, one of the reasons was, you know, because I have a lot of close family that have adopted. And so it's really but the other question I was kind of thinking thinking of my own situation. Um, I have my brother-in-law and sister-in-law adopted a boy from Japan. I have a nephew that adopted a boy from Japan. Mm. And I have a cousin who married a Caucasian and adopted a child who was uh, half Caucasian and mm. half Japanese. Mm. Mm. And these are, I'm talking, these are males, mm. they have never indicated to the parents to find out. Mm. Mm. Is that because they're males or it, what? It, you know, this this is very, very, very common. I think, so I've been involved in many adoptee communities over the years, and um, I'd say it's probably 15 to 20 percent at best um, males were 80 to 85 percent females and I think it's because we are the ones who can get pregnant who get pregnant you know who who have that experience and so or often it comes up when people have children or they have a pregnancy or they're involved in something like that and I think it's easier for um male sometimes to just to feel less impacted on a personal level but i think the first time you think oh my gosh did, is, there, is there a positive pregnancy test you're immediately put into the same situation that maybe your birth mother was in you know i think it's a, it's a bodily felt thing that i think really and it's also if you you know you have a child um i mean i when when i had all of my children and all of my pregnancies i really it really brought me back to her situation every time in, in whatever way. So I, th I think that that has something to do with it.